Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat and Ranking the Albums. That's right. We're going to kill two birds with one stone here tonight. We've had lots of requests over the months and years. Pete, when are you guys going to rank the Roger Waters solo albums? Right. We talked a lot about Roger. We talked a ton about Pink Floyd, but we've never done the solo albums. And the reason why we haven't is because of this guy right here. So uh, up until a couple months ago, I never owned a Roger Waters solo album for various reasons. Uh, if you've watched many of my uh, Pink Floyd shows here on the channel, you probably know why. But I said, all right, you know what? I should own these. I should listen to them and give them some time and come up with some opinions on. So I have. I've had these for a few months. Uh, we're talking about the four. As, as Lewis was pointing out to all of us before we started taping, there are all sorts of Roger Waters albums, classical and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so maybe at the end, Lewis will kind of go through some of the ones we don't rank. But today we're just ranking the four kind of rock albums right so we're talking about uh pros and cons of hitchhiking amused to death uh radio chaos and uh is this the life we really want so uh those are the ones that we're doing and uh we've got in the house today i've got to introduce everybody pete's just blathering on here so we've got uh, all the way from scotland we got stephen reed we got from the great white north armando venditti and rick Hello. labonte and Martin Popoff, we are the Canadian connection here today. And then uh, from Chicago, just kind of below Canada, we've got uh, Mr. Lewis Nasser. So how's everybody doing? Excellent. Doing, doing good. good. Part of this. Doing well, really good. Fun. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, Rick, I, I like Rick's background. And I do want to say we have uh, two brand new shirts in the store. One has got the, the old style Sea of Tranquility logo with planets and stuff in the background. It looks amazing. So, uh, Rick, uh, I think pretty soon you're going to have to go and grab. Oh, look at that. And we, didn't, we didn't rehearse that at all. Pretty cool. Nope. Pretty cool. So, yes, right, we got that. And we have a new monster. Again. New Monsters End shirt as well, which has the guy with the axe for all of you people who like that sort of thing. So go uh, check it out. We'll have a link in the video description below. So uh, we've each ranked these four albums from our kind of least favorite to our favorite. We'll start at number four. We'll go back to number one. We'll go Stephen, Armando, Rick, Martin, Lewis, and myself, and then go round and round till we get to number one. So uh, Stephen Reed, what do you got for your very, very first uh, selection here at number four? Okay, well... We've done quite a lot of album rankings over the, the months and years of Sea of Tranquility, and I think this may well be the first one that I have looked at where I thought, I probably know the order of these before I even think about it. <laughs> and I went back and I've listened to all of these albums again, and I've come with exactly the order that I thought I would. Now that is a rarity. So there is lots of surprises in this catalogue, but there are no surprises in this catalogue. They all sound remarkably like Roger Waters albums. There's a real oeuvre there. There's a real way of construction. They mainly all revolve around the concept. Some are stronger than others, shall we say. Um, and that is a theme with where I start. So my number four is Radio Chaos. So this is from 1987. This is Roger's second solo album. And it's by no means a bad album, but it's interesting, certainly from my point of view anyway, Waters is a very singular character, knows what he wants, and will do everything to go and get it. And this is the one album that's impacted by its time, I think. This is the one where he is infected by that thing that all classic prog artists seemed to be at some point in the 80s, where he suddenly seems to lose his focus and become part of his time. I don't know if anybody else wants to give a, have a go at the concept of this one, because this one, to me, is here, there and everywhere. It starts with a backdrop of the miners' strike in the UK, which was obviously a massive part of our history. It's also a backdrop of the Cold War, which definitely seemed quite a disparate sort of two starting points. Woven in there somewhere is the plight of the old-fashioned radio station. And then we move from there into a disabled chap who has the ability or realises the ability to control radio waves through his breaking, you know, the brand new technology, the cordless phone. 
you know, so that we're already showing our age here. And then there's a nuclear war mocked up by this guy by controlling radio waves. But at the same time, he manages to, I think, disarm the capability to defend against this war that isn't going to happen. And then everyone at the end goes, oh, don't we love each other? Uh, which is a bit odd more than anything else. I think that's what I pick up from Radio Chaos. Others may have other ideas and I'm more than happy to be corrected, shall we say, for that. Um, the interesting thing for me is the, the track that I like probably best of this album is The Powers That Be. Yeah. Uh, and it's got a guy called Paul Carrick singing on that. Paul Carrick is probably best known as one of the front men from Mike and the Mechanics. Um, he sang with Ace, um, Squeeze for a period of time, but he's anything but the sort of guy that you would expect. He's a very talented singer, and I like a lot of his work, but would you expect to hear him on a Roger Waters album? Well, you would on an album that's kind of got some blue-eyed soul and a little bit of kind of pop funk and various things. And that's kind of where things fall down, but it still sounds like a Roger Waters album. So it's an interesting endeavour. I think it's a little bit flawed, but I still quite like it. So my number four is Radio Chaos. Cool. All right, Armando. Uh, my number four is Radio Chaos. Um, and just to expand a little bit on what Stephen was saying, um, it's majorly flawed. I'm sorry, um, out of the four. It sounds of its time. It's an 80s production. It's, it's, it was supposed to be, well, first of all, Roger Waters denounces the album. He hates it. He regrets making it. He was pushed into a more modern sound for production and he hated it. He said basically that he and <clears throat> Ian Ritchie and uh, uh, what's his, yeah, the guy's name, um, Nick Griffiths, sorry. Uh, that they fucked up the production, basically. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a half-hearted storyline. Um, because it wasn't a double album, I think they, they chopped it up and they couldn't continue with it. Like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's just, it's, it's an album of its time. So I just, it, no, it's out of the four, it's the, my least favorite, so. Because it's just, you know, the, the, the program drums, uh, the program, you know, the, the synth basses and the whole, it's just, I can't, ugh, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I, no, I'm seriously, like, it's really, really bad. And he, like, again, like I said, he denounced the album. He can't stand that album. So. But he does play the songs live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he doesn't denounce yeah. the music. He, he just doesn't like the sound of it. The production of that. Yeah, the production of it. Yeah, it's it's, yeah, yeah. it's very much of its time, you know. Um, and you've got little snippets of Margaret Thatcher, like you know, near the end of the album, like in terms of like, just the storyline itself is stilted, right? Um, he wanted to make it more, make it a double album, so that he could flush out the ideas of it to make it more more rounded, right? Like you know, your favorite album, Pete the Wall, right? So. Um, but he wasn't allowed. He wasn't allowed to. So, and he took a bath on the on the tour that followed it. So, um, he lost a lot of money on it. So, yeah, number four. Yeah, probably not the yeah, album yes. he wanted. Fresh, fully free from Pink Floyd, right? But uh -huh. oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he just went the other way completely. Yeah, yeah. He just completely. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't. All right, well, we got two radio chaoses in the bottom spot. So, uh, Rick, you going to continue that trend, or are we going to see something else? Well, I concur with uh, what they said. Um, it is uh, my number four as well. But I don't dislike the record. I just don't. I just think there's other three are stronger. And one thing you got to learn about, well, if you don't know Roger Waters, he's politically charged. So everything's a, some kind of political statement at some point. And I like that. I'm an activist here in my own community and I do stuff. And mm -hmm. I like the guy that he does uh, speak his mind. But it is the, like a product of the times and the drum program and everything that was said before. Uh, the difference in this album is that he played all the role. So like uh, on the other, um, he brings actors and people play 
roles and pros and cons and hit track and he did it all the voice the 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 computer the, all that different sound and uh and so it's not surprising that he would do these kind of albums later on being a voice and narrator for other projects because he's really good at it and the guy's an actor as a singer i mean he's like you listen to him whether whether albums that we're talking about he acted out the scene i think that's what makes the wall so famous that's what makes some of these uh things that he've always been known for uh but in this uh one of the things you can say about roger waters and all four albums he always brings some you know amazing guitar player as a guest I mean, when you have David Gilmore, amazing player from Pink Floyd, you got to bring some star power. In this case, it's uh, um, it's uh, Andy uh, Fairweatherlow, and uh, he he was the guitar player in there. And if you know the other ones, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and it continued. So he always uh, had to bring some uh, star power, and that's what you have in this. Plus, you got some great uh, horn players on this album uh, that do got names, you know, and and so. Uh, Obviously, you're so respected. You can you don't have problem getting musicians, musicians to come and join and on your album and perhaps a tour. Now, with this album, um, reason why it's down there it's only because it did sound a little bit corporate. One of my uh, beef with the momentary lapse of reason it sounds corporate Pink Floyd. I never Pretty felt so. like it was the analog. It sounding it had all the drum samples and stuff like that. And I would say on record that I thought. Roger Waters or even David Gilmore, their solo records are better than post Roger Waters Pink Floyd albums, in my opinion. I mean, I'll take them solo versus what Pink Floyd did without Roger Waters. Now, mind you, Final Cut, it got, uh, it's not the strongest hour. Uh, I do like Cup of Tune, but it's not, I think their finest hour ended with The Wall as a band, as a unit. And, uh, and he did take some of that. What he's been famous for, whether it was Dark Side and Moon, you know, all those sampling of audio sound going back and forth, he traditionally kept that going through all his uh, discography. Where it's ear candy when you hear headphones and hear the telephone ring and all this stuff. It's pretty, uh, imagine, you know, the imagination is just there. And so one of the things you also can mention about Roger Waters when we talk about any of these albums, it's a solid to listen. It's not something I'm going to say, hey, guys, let's play some pool, play some cards, and listen to music. Now, I can do that with Dark Side and Moon. I can do that with maybe Animals in which you hear. But this is a solid to listen. This is something you do alone to get the full effect of the song because of the dynamics and peaks and valleys. And this album is no exception, except he went a little more on a poppy flavor by having the backup vocals and some of the horn session with... You know, was pretty uh, popular among his peers in the 80s. If you think about Steve Winwood or Roger uh, Roger Daltrey's uh, solo record, all the 80s and the mid, uh, especially 85, a lot of them were trying to bring that fresh uh, 80s sound. So I think he went along with the trend, and and that's why the album suffers a little bit. Instead of just doing what you normally do, Roger, just keep it up, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, I still enjoy it. And one other thing that's interesting about this tour uh, is that he acted as a DJ would take requests from the audience. You know, that's pretty bold because you never know what you're going to get. Now, I don't know if he stays that, but it was some shows he would literally act as a DJ will find out, hey, what do you want to hear? And someone can say something from, you know, the deep collar log and he would wing it or they would play it. So that's pretty interesting in that, uh, um, you know, for him to do that. And I would say I've been a fan from Roger. I saw him ever since the uh, music to death tour and on. There wasn't a show in Toronto and Detroit that I didn't see. If he was bringing the Dark Side and Moon production back, the wall, or the latest one with the Us and Them tour, I'm a big fan and I like what he had to do. And he always leave you walking walking away like, wow, that was amazing. So even if the album isn't as strong, you will walk away a happy customer that you went to saw that tour because he did do a lot of justice in doing Pink Floyd too. So that's my uh, number four. You just imagine, you know, at one of those shows where he's doing the DJ thing and he's taking requests and some guy in the front row goes, play Adam Hart, mother dude. And he's probably like, mm, yeah, not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, sure. I'll, play, I'll play a 20 minute suite for you guys, right? Yeah, it's... right. <laughs> that we haven't played in 30 plus years, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, Martin, what do you got at number four? 
Uh, I also have Radio Chaos at number four. So yeah, June 15th, 1987, we've got the uh, the Morse code cover art. Uh, I think Roger has four really bad album covers and this is one of them. Um, you know, and, and I, I have to I have to mention, you know, it's it's pretty wild that, you know, at this time he's doing this and this this album is not that well received. And again, it is uh, it is dated keyboard uh, dated drum sounds more than anything dated keyboard sounds even manages to have the sax sound dated on it. Uh, I agree with everybody that you know that the the storyline is he's trying to pack too much in but that's because it did be begin as a double album concept called home. Right. Um, and to me, this reminds me a little bit of rush clockwork uh, clockwork angels, as well as um, uh, Pete Townsend psycho derelict in, in a way right uh, it. Yeah. And, yeah. and Tommy, there's a bit of Tommy to it as well, yes. right? Um, so it's got it's got all these things packed into it. Way too much action for a single album, for a short single album, 41 minutes long. And uh, and as you guys have said, you know, he 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 and Ian Ritchie basically he blames himself and Ian Ritchie for making it sound like this. But you know, and to add a few other artists to the uh, domain, you know, Rick, like you mentioned, right? Um, ZZ Top at this time, David Bowie at this time, Never Let Me Down, and Tonight, uh, Rush at this time, Hold Your Fire and Power Windows and all that stuff, right? So um, now now I definitely, this is the one album of the four that I don't absolutely love. Um, I wouldn't go so far as as Stephen did to say, you know, it's, I, I would put it in around the five, five range. Um, because even though uh, it's got all that bad production, there's still a lot, a lot of Roger that comes through on the thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. This is, this is really, this was clearly, clearly going to be the last one for me. Okay. Oh, at one last Agreed. thing, I, just to mention in context with the whole Pink Floyd thing, Momentary Lapse of Reason is coming out and it goes four times platinum. And, uh, and this yeah. doesn't certify at all. The first one goes gold. He never certifies ever again. So, so it's crazy. Right. And, and we see, as Rick says, it, he, he does a, a complete, you know, really smart, career switcheroo on pink floyd and becomes becomes the massive version of pink floyd live but the records not so much people kind of don't care about the records as much yeah martin it's almost kind of like the jeff tate situation right jeff goes out on the road now and he mainly just plays queens albums and he draws fairly well people are into it nobody buys his solo albums or his new yeah. band albums it's kind of a similar situation here not quite on that scale obviously but yeah, yeah. well just quickly the the criticism after I saw the last show um, of, with uh, for is this the world we really want? I was at, I was doing my workout and a couple that were at the gym said to me, "Oh, they were at the show and he's too political for me." And it's like, "Well, where did you think you were going? Like, it's a Roger <laughs> Waters concert, right? You know, I mean, like it." <laughs> Yeah, it's consistent. Like, it is what it is. Like he is political. I mean, that's what he does. He has like, for you, decades, right? Yeah. Like yeah, what like, are you expecting? Yeah. You know, it's like God. So yeah, well, to, to them, they probably just just play the whole Wall album and shut up, and then let us go home happy, right? That's all we want to hear. Well, yeah, that's, well, that's the curse, right? Yeah, that's the curse because if you if you try to do something new, people are gonna bitch at you because you're not playing the hits, and if all you do is play the hits. People are going to bitch at you because you're taking no risks. It's a bloody double-edged sword. So, I mean, uh, this is why I think down. people like David Bowie do the right thing. They do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. And, and that's Pretty it. Much. Because, because at least they have their own integrity to, to preserve. Right? Yeah. You can't no, please everybody. Uh, for my number four, I, I, I can't really... I'm also going to pick Radio Chaos. However, I don't, I don't think... Although... It is a 1987 album, and whoever invented gated reverb is going to have to have a, a lot of fucking explaining to do, right? <laughs> because that sound is dreadful. Um, I, I, I still think that the story um, that he tried to tell is not terrible. It's just, um, it's, 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 it's silly in the same way... That, and I think that that Martin was that was a very insightful remark. It's silly in exactly the same nonsensical ways that Tommy is silly. There is if, if you if you try to follow the story linearly, it's it's borderline idiotic. Yeah. But when you hear it in the context of the music and you hear the ideas, 
it's it's it, there's a lot of empathy that you that you can get with that music and i i find that out of all the catalog this is pretty much the only roger waters album i own and i just have to say that for me this is like a very all of them are a very deep part of my musical dna but the the idea that he has an, an uplifting song called the Titus turning to me is almost like what the hell happened because this is something I was not expecting. I mean, if you, I, I am always of the opinion that that you have to really pay attention to the music and the lyrics, because with especially with, with Roger Waters, they are fundamental. And so is with Pink Floyd. And um, you know, you hear the powers that be. You know, they they like a tough game, no rules. Some they win, some you lose, but the competition's good for you. And he just goes on like this, you know, he's just talking about the politics of the time, the hopelessness of the time, yeah. the panic of the Cold War. You guys remember um, the, the day after? You know, there was a lot of that stuff happening in the 80s, right? So exactly. that was still there. And um, so the fact that he addressed it and there's this comical Tommy-like character who has radio waves in his brain and can control all the nuclear codes and anything really to do with EM waves is actually almost funny, but it's supposed to be a, a hopeful message, which I think is not his forte, which is why I don't, it's not my favorite of all the ones he's done, but it's not silly. It's, 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 it's very Tommy-like. I think that it's a very great take. So that like is- Like an silly. off-Broadway, eh? Like an off-Broadway where- uh... and, Yeah, and the thing is, you know, when he was doing the tour, you know, he was famously quoted as saying that a momentary lapse of reason was the best possible title for that album. They were always fighting. And this guy's going insane because he can barely sell out theaters. And these other guys are playing, you know, the old stuff, the same stuff he's playing in a, in, in, in a football stadium somewhere. Right. So he was, he was hating life when this came out and he did the tour. I have my, this is my ticket from that, but you know, it's, it's just, um, he was pissed, you know, and he did do the the shtick with the DJ, which I thought was pretty funny, you know. Suddenly he started playing set the control for the heart of the sun. He had a couple of things prepared. I think it was staged, but but it was good, you know. And um, I that's my number four. All right. So let me preface this by saying so I, I said at the beginning of the episode that uh, I've really only I've heard a lot of these albums over the years, but I never owned them up until a couple of months ago. So I spent a lot of time with all four of these in recent months. And I will say two of them, I think are pretty good. The other two, I don't care for really all that much. I don't think I love any of them. Uh, and I think that's the reason why I stayed away from buying these all these years, because most of what I heard, I never really loved. I like stuff here and there, and I still kind of feel the same way. Uh, but unlike on last night's Hudson Valley Squares episode, uh, I am going to break the uh, the shutout right here for my number four. And I'm going to go with, uh, is this the life we really want from 2017? Uh, I know Martin loves this album. I think a couple of you actually really love this album. <laughs> I've tried. I don't know. Um, I find, I think I'm finding in my older age that I really don't enjoy like minimalistic type albums. And I think a lot of this album is just really barren of instrumentation and a lot of spoken word vocals the instrumentation is very sparse i do like a couple songs uh, i think deja vu is a really cool song that could have come off the wall it's very moody and melancholy it even reminds me of the little bit that i like off the final cut um picture this has some cool like menace to it and that's that's kind of the angry roger waters i really like um, Bird in the Gale is a really cool song. It reminds me of kind of Berlin era Bowie. It's got this avant-garde feel to it. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the album I find kind of meandering and a little boring. And I'm, I, I kept I keep listening to this and listening to it, like thinking, what am I missing here? But I think it's just me, and and that's totally cool because you know you can't like everything. But um, yeah, that's my number four, the most recent one from 2017. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Back to Steven. What are you going to do? Uh, place it higher. No, anyway, moving along. <laughs> <laughs> As Simon would say, I'm wrong, correct? <laughs> Simon put... But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so my number three, I'm going back to the first solo album. Um, in 1984, 
this is the pros and cons of hitchhiking. And to me, this, although there's no denying it all the way through the four albums, this is the one where I think this is just an extension of what he had left behind with Pink Floyd. The album is remarkably of that kind of tone and atmosphere. Um, the band is stellar. There's a guy, Andy Bone, who plays Hammond organ uh, on this album, who I gave a remarkably hard time to in some of our status quo album rankings, um, but he's quite phenomenal on, on this album. And then you've got uh, Michael Kamen, who plays piano. He's also a co-producer on the album. I think the album sounds fantastic. And he's obviously a big part in that. Andy Newmark on drums, who's played with everybody, anybody and everybody, and the guy's outstanding. And then you've got what should be the ace in the hole on guitar, which is Eric Clapton. And there are two schools of thought with his playing on this album. And my personal opinion is that he's very good if you want to hear a kind of bluesy version of Eric Clapton being David Gilmer, because it's clear where, I mean, I won't cover the concept this time, I'll let somebody else do that, but it's clear that this album was brought into being when Roger was still in Pink Floyd, and it was presented to the band as an option to go ahead with. And the other option that they had was The Wall. They chose The Wall. They obviously chose Right. History would tell you that. But this is a remarkably strong album, and I think that would have made a remarkably fantastic Pink Floyd album. And to hear Clapton really play against type, I think. I mean, you're, you're at, for me personally, you're at the title track, which is, I think, track 10, before you think, oh, that's Clapton. And that it's really interesting in that sense to hear a musician with such a unique style and way of playing, it's where the, the slow hand name comes from, it's a shame that in real recent times he's proven to be a bit of a, what we would call here in Scotland, a bell end. But there you go. Um, but on this album, I really find it a fascinating listen because you have to remind yourself it's Eric Clapton at times. He is allowed to kind of step forward at certain points. But I think the album is really, really good. I, I really enjoy it. Um, the concept allows it to play out in real time. I don't, still don't really like the concept on this one. It's about a midlife crisis and various things, and it's played out in dream time and so on and so on. But yeah, I, I really do quite like it. The one thing that I think is missing, in inverted commas, from, from what I really like about a Roger Waters album is it doesn't have quite so many songs that have got that big, bold chorus, that thing that you can kind of chant along with and it sticks in the mind at the end. Again, the title track, and we're nearly at the end of the album by that stage, is the one where you think, yeah, okay, we've kind of arrived now, and it maybe just arrives a little bit late for my personal taste. But to me, we've gone from Radio Chaos, which I'm not a massive fan of, but I will listen to, to an album that I'm putting it three out of four, and I really like it. So the pros and cons of Hitchhiking is my number three. Armando. Well, these are the perils of not being able to go first because Stephen and I did not rehearse this. <laughs> what so bloody ever? Um, but uh, pros and cons are my are my number three. Um, not to mirror what Stephen said, but yeah, no, I mean, with the cast of characters he has, like Eric Clapton on main guitar, etc. I mean, this is basically an extension of a Pink Floyd album. You know. Uh, again, this was presented to uh, Pink Floyd as a possibility after the, uh, the story goes very quickly. They did a concert in Montreal. Um, Wanders got ticked off at one of the fans, walked over to him and spit in his face, was so disillusioned because he wanted the fans to sit and listen to the music. So the next day he started doing the, the demos for what would become The Wall uh, within that week or the next day or whatever. So he presented both albums to, to the group, both ideas, and they went with the wall. So he, he put this on the shelf for himself for later. I think this would have been a good Pink Floyd album. Because, I mean, it just every album that he does is about looking at yourself and looking at the world around you and looking at what's going on in the world. And, how can we, 
how can we be happy if all this strife is going on, right? So, um, I mean, the album itself is fantastic. I mean, but it's just, it's, it's, an, it's an angry waters. He's angry up at, like he's angry all the time <laughs> during these doing these albums. He's always ticked off. He's always pissed off about something, you know. So it's like at one point you just gotta say, okay, enough. Like, you know, is there anything that will make you happy? Anything why? that can why why do you need him to to, to stop? Why does it have to be enough? It's kind of his thing, right? You know. <laughs> yeah, well, quite no, the it is, it is Animals thing. is angry all the way through. Yeah. yeah, the it's anger of animals to... is in yeah, every no, no, no. superior to this one, right? Definitely. His, his idea it, seems to be to reflect the world that he sees. Yes. Yeah. And if you see it through his eyes, and I'm not going to argue too hard, especially right now, I can't really argue. <laughs> so no, no, uh, now more than ever, right? Yeah. <laughs> these days, no. These days, uh, if you were to release it now, it would, it would probably, you know go over big i'm just saying that overall he's 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 usually angry through every you know from the pros and cons to you know radio waves and and um i just you know i mean eric clapton's playing on this album is amazing you know um i think he underused him to an extent slightly but um i you know and and i was reading that when they did the tour for, for pros and cons, he told the musicians, play it note for note. Don't go off on a guitar solo. Don't go off on a tangent. Play it note for note. And, and they said that was fine, but it took the spontaneity out of the whole thing for them. Like it wasn't, it wasn't fun for them. So, um, and I mean, for those who don't know, the, the storyline starts um, from, from a dream that happened from like 4.30 in the morning to like 5.00. 12 that same morning you know so it's a cycle of a dream right yeah, so it's in real time in real time so yeah. um pretty cool the seconds hand is the beat what was it sorry what was that the seconds of the clock there's a clock that comes in and yeah, out. yeah yeah that yeah, is marking exactly. the beat mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and there's a lot of songs in threes and it's it's, it's a really great idea actually yeah it is. i mean i mean the, the concept is a good idea. It's 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 unique. I'm just saying, for me, it it, it lacks something. I can't put my finger on it, but it's just you got to rank them, right? So for me, it's number four. It's number three. So yeah, cool. okay, Rick. Well, you know, when it comes to the ne next three, I like them so close. It's almost neck to neck to me. It really is a struggle, and I think it only comes down to how long I own these albums that I end up, uh, how I rank them because I appreciate it so much. And, uh, and yeah, um, and just to go to that point, uh, and like Lewis said, I mean, let's Roger Waters' character right through and through. Um, you know, he's known to drop the F-bomb or swear word here and there because how do you talk about politics without getting angry when it's a 45-minute thing? Yeah. And so whether it's goody-good bullshit and then uh, money and dark side of the moon to... All the way up to the latest record, he told he do it. So, um, just because I'm making this number three doesn't mean I love it any less. I really like it. It's a, more of a concise album. It was produced by the Radiohead producer. I do like uh, is this the life we really want, and and I think it's a good album. But those other two are more more history and more. I listen it long enough, and I I can almost just. Say that song title and I hear it in real time in my head. But I this one of the albums that I appreciate more and more as I listen to it. Um, and for the reason that Pete gave, there are some great strong moments. The, the ones he mentioned are great. And I would add maybe Smell the Roses mind me a lot like uh, a Pink Floyd music. And so, uh, and when you listen to this with earbuds though, it's truly ear candy or all that stuff i mean if you listen to still you're missing out because you gotta get into the headspace and how he did it sonically and if you know anything about uh, roger almost every tour from 93 on and like they did in um in the animal tour everything quantiphonic like it's all four it had speakers all around the arena yeah. so you hear voices well they do that seriously with this whether you own a 5.1 surround sound or not you get that kind of um 
uh, that kind of presentation just with the left and right earbuds. It's really cool. I didn't think he kept what he'd known for with all those telephone ringing and all these things that conversations that go on between just like in the wall. And so that feels like, okay, this is one of his masterpieces. I really like the record. Uh, I just think the other ones are, um, I just love it because I know it more. Uh, but when I first listened to it, I was really impressed. But like I said, it's not something like, hey, buddy, let's sit back and listen to this. This is a private record. It is a solitude record. It's like solitary. You're playing a card game by yourself when you listen to an album like that. And But it's great. You know, it's one of those, you know, Sunday morning, I uh, put that on and listen to it, have a coffee and just... And it's uh, and going to like the video of your mind, picturing the scene that he's just driving, because that's what it is. It's a very visual, uh, audio music. You know, it's not like they make it in your face and they paint it so you can't miss. It. You have your, you have yeah, room to interpret. Yeah, you do. And I think that's what's great about his music and why, as a vocalist. Uh, he is an actor, and I can feel the emotion on every time he he articulate his uh his the lyric line or what he's trying to say. And he's gonna drop an f bomb here and there, and he's gonna do that because he's so in the character that it's transparent. That's it. So I think it's uh, number three, and it's not a, a bad score. It's really almost neck to neck. It's like a point five less than something that I'm gonna share later. So that's my uh, my rank. All right, Martin. Okay, my number three is Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Um, another bad album cover, even more dated uh, in terms of an album cover than Radio Chaos. This this is like absolutely of its time, and he got a lot of trouble for that, and just the whole idea this is Gerald Scarf with the, the classic Gerald Scarf writing. Um, I, I agree. Um, Steve, when you said that, that it's pretty interesting when, when you said how how we're waiting for those big, big melodic payoff choruses and they don't really come. So this is a record that I I've owned all my life. And, uh, you know, since it came out and I really don't remember much of it, except these are the pros, you know, the, the, yeah, the big yeah, chorus, yeah. right. Um, but um, so, yeah, this came out April 30th, 84. It did go gold, but it took uh, it, it went gold in 95. So it took 11 years to go gold. Um, I, I find there is a lot of Eric Clapton on it. That's what you hear a lot of. And he's doing, uh, as you said, Stephen, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a it's a cross between Eric Clapton and David Gilmore that he's doing there. Right. And I, I think he's really high up in the mix when you do hear him. So it's almost distracting. Um, but he's doing what Eric Clapton does and he does it well and all that stuff. And this band, this band is essentially a, uh, a, a uh, almost like a, like a more efficient, more evolved version of a Pink Floyd band. So, so characteristically, I suppose you could say it's going to have less the, you know, the story legendary personality of those Pink Floyd guys, because now he's into just every record, it's just an army of people. Like it barely even matters who they are kind of thing. And they're in there doing their really good job. But um, I, I, I find the storyline, this in real time thing is a little odd and distracting. I, I find like the story, almost like the summation of the story is better than the lyrics because the lyrics to me feel more like dream than they do like plot. Um, and, uh, and it's just, they're colorful. He uses a lot of showy, big, colorful words and they're, they're entertaining that way. Um, but to me, this is an album I love more because it is absolutely probably the most plush, masterpieceful uh, album in a Pink Floyd sense, even more so than any Pink Floyd album. It, it, makes, it makes every Pink Floyd album sound like a demo. You know, um, so so it's uh, it's pretty incredible the amount of sound effects and he put that he puts in it and stuff. And and as you guys have said earlier, that this is the one because of that um, radio chaos is definitely of its time. This is this is timeless. It, it's yeah. really not linked to a time at all, uh, even though it's 1984, which is a very very fraught year of making big mistakes by big artists, and he, and he doesn't make mistakes, which is which is a beautiful thing. So there you go, number yeah. three, pros and cons. That's a good point. It doesn't sound anything like Radio Chaos, and they, they couldn't be any more different. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. All right, Lewis. Uh, well, for me, and again, this was not coordinated, but for me, it's also going to be my number three. Now, of course, because I live in America, some Puritan asshole had to put a sticker over the girl's ass. Yeah, that's a censored version. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is this just makes it even more stupid, I believe, than the original. Yeah. Um, I. 
like I said, I, as a kid, I listened to this with headphones over and over and over and over, right? And um, I guess I don't listen to music looking for choruses and sing-alongs and, and make me feel good. Um, and that way I am like Stephen Wilson. Happy music makes me miserable and miserable music makes me happy. And um, I really don't care about, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want the obvious syrup. I hate that shit. I fucking hate it. So for me, the pacing of this record and the, and just the, the way that the instruments come in and the way that this guy's having this dream, I, I honestly can't imagine, even though David Gilmour is arguably my favorite guitarist, I just can't imagine this poor guy having to sing about Arabs with knives at the foot of the bed. I can't, I don't see it happening. I just don't see that he doesn't have that in him. And I think that, um, that the, the record as a whole is um, when I was a kid, I didn't understand it very well because I, how the fuck could I understand a midlife crisis? I was just starting off. Right. I didn't get it. Right. It didn't make sense to me. But the music and the way that he puts it together, it's it's everything that he does. It's so intro. It, it, it just makes you fall inwards. You have to listen to it and you have to take it. It is really like uh, like watching a movie. I, I can give one analogy. My daughter, the same year I took her to see three bands, The Who, King Crimson and Roger Waters. And then later, she, she just volunteered a ranking. Now, the way she does is she, she goes to the concert, she watches the thing, then she'll borrow all my CDs and hide in her room and listen to them and then return them. And she won't talk about it. And eventually, she told me that she, she ranked the Who number three, King Crimson number two. And she said, King Crimson does with sound what Roger Waters does with video. That's the way she described it. And um, but the Roger Waters that was that was just too good for her. That visual experience of the us and them um, tour it was just it, it just blew her mind. And I think that for me, without all that benefit of seeing the guy live when I started out, I just had to take the trip with the panning and the the binaural experience, right? And I I love it. I, I, I wish now as an adult, I, I wish Eric Clapton wasn't on it, knowing what I know about him, because I can't associate it to, right? It's kind of like a negative for me now. But, um, but back in the day when he did this, this was great. And this, I love it, right? My, I, I'm, I'm like, uh, Rick, I mean, the difference between these albums is minimal because they're all so special to me, right? But if I had to rank them, which I had to do for this, which was, um, this is my number three, but it is a very, it's almost like, like when you get to the title track is when he breaks from the clock tempo. If you listen to it, it's no longer this thing in threes, it's this thing in fours. And he's really, you know, it's, he's kind of stretching out. It's like, he's building tension throughout the whole thing. And then he gives you the song you want to hear, right? It's kind of an interesting idea. I, I, I like it, but, um, but I can see how that would also annoy people, right? It's, it's, um, it's not. It's not user friendly. It's just not. I'm sitting here thinking it must have been interesting for your daughter trying to like rank the performances of those three legendary bands. And she's probably thinking, okay, King Crimson, yeah, not very visual. It's like the only guy who even moves on stage is the bald headed bass player with the long mustache, right? <laughs> That's right. it. All the other guys, they don't move at all. He, at least Tony sways from side to side a bit, right? Yeah, no, no, she. <laughs> But she loved the sound, and she she hadn't she hadn't really heard those records. But she was like she paid attention, which yeah. for me was was really rewarding. That well done, you know, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Apple don't fall from the tree, right? <laughs> well, I don't know, but good for her, Julia. Well done. <laughs> I can imagine if I took my wife to a King Crimson concert, she'd probably like walk out after the first song. <laughs> Actually, I think my sister did walk out on a Roger Ward on the. Yeah. And the, it was it was pros and cons. My sister walked out on it. My brother in law took her, and she's like, "This is shit. I got to get out of here." Wow. She walked out. Said, okay. I, I talked my wife into going to a Yes concert. It was the tour where they played only the ten minute songs nobody had ever heard of before. Oh god. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm not sure went over big. Uh, Massey Hall. That was, I, I can't remember how the tour works, but, but yeah, it, it was, it was, we're going to play all our long epics that nobody knows. Kind of thing. I'm lucky. My girlfriend comes to all the shows and we dig it. Um, yeah. yeah. I learned my lesson. The, the last concert I took my wife to, that was something that she didn't really know or like. I, and this is the second time I took her to see the Allman Brothers Band. But I took her to see the Almonds, and it was during a bad rainstorm. It was an outdoor show, but we were under a, uh, you know, a roof. And I remember it was like a quarter of the way through the show. And she goes to me, she goes, does every song they're going to play tonight have to have a 10 minute guitar solo? And I'm like, Oh boy, this yes. is going to be a long night. <laughs> <laughs> but meanwhile, she said the exact same exactly. thing to me like five years before when I took her to the, or even more for the first yeah. time. And I didn't learn my lesson. Never learned my lesson when it comes Quickly. To I, I went with Bob to the, uh, when Roger Waters was here, he did, when he did the wall and he had never heard the wall like at all. And I mean, obviously he heard the singles, but he, had no idea what the concept was. So I, I tried to prepare him as much as I could. I took him, he sat there transfixed. He right. couldn't get enough of it. He says to me, this is the best show I've ever seen. And I said, well, if you're the show before this was Anne Murray, then you know what? You've got a lot to catch up on. I'm telling you right now, but. Not everybody's as open to music they haven't heard before. I mean, it's. A, yeah, the, it's really... kudos to Bob because the wall is not an easy listen. No, he loved it. He was just like, like, ugh, like, just yeah. gobsmacked. He could not believe what he was seeing, yeah, yeah. right? And it was a production. It was a production, so. My number three is uh, Radio Chaos. You know, I really struggle with my number three and number four about how to rank them, right? Uh, yeah, this is a kind of a weird album. I mean, it has its moments. It's even stylistically. I mean, I know it's 87 and I, we, we talked a bit about the production values and all that kind of stuff. It, um, it It's kind of art rock kind of new wave almost like it almost has like like early industrial flair to me um but it's got some good songs. i mean radio waves is pretty cool who needs information i like quite a bit uh i like the female backing vocals on this album i think he's always done a really good job of utilizing the the backing vocals i think on all of his records for the most part uh andy fairweather low is great on here i yes. think if it wasn't for him this would be my bottom one but I really like his guitar tone on this album. His, his uh, solos are really kind of stinging and have lots of emotion to it. So I don't know. Half of it's good. Half of it's just okay. This, I think, out of all of his three albums, I think sounds the least Pink Floyd-like, to my ears anyway. But, yeah. uh, but it's pretty good. I don't love it, but it's, a, but it's good. But it's weird. But uh, that's my number three. Back to Steven. So my number two... There was the only near surprise when I came to rank these albums was how close this actually came to being number one. So my number two is, is this the life we really want? Because uh, it, 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 I think this is quite outstanding. And it really kind of went under the radar. It never got any notice. It got some positive reviews, but most people were kind of, it was platitudes. Oh, it's amazing he's doing something this good at this stage of his career kind of thing. Do you know? I think it's much more than that. And it's interesting listening to other opinions that have come up about it because I actually think that some of the things you struggled with, Peter, are exactly what I like about it. I like how contained the album is. Roger Waters is famous, as Armando says, for being angry. He's an angry man. I think he's resigned here. I think that there's a resignation here that says, do you know what? All of my life, I've been telling you everything that's coming to this point. And did you listen? You didn't listen. And here we are. We're still well bloody well here. If you'd listened to me, this might be different right now. And the whole album, as you see, he's, he doesn't sing an awful lot of it. He kind of half talks an awful lot of it. It's almost like he's going, oh, I can't believe I'm having to say this again now. <laughs> and had he made it, not in 2017, but in 2022, he'd be even more correct because we're still not listening and we're still heading further down all of these paths. And it's a remarkable piece of work on that level. On the musical level, wow, the sound is just out of this world. I know that we said well, headphone album, it is, but today, because I'm sitting working, as a, as a lot of us do these days from home, and it, it reminded me of being a teenager because the little setup I've got on my desk, the speakers are on the desk, and as I played this, so the volume went up and up and up 
and up until I was like, I was being back in my bedroom when I was 14, 15 with the speakers either side of my ears going, I want it louder. But not because I wanted to rock out, but just because there's so much going on. The string arrangements are outstandingly good. The vocals are just absolutely brilliant. The sounds are coming from all, all over the place. And I think to do that in such a controlled manner, but with such a strong message, is really quite something special. And the fact that I'm ranking it at number two will tell you that I think there's even better to come. But th this is my number two. And if you haven't heard that, if you kind of thought that Roger Waters was spent, well, you didn't listen to what's come before, but this proves that he's not. And I genuinely hope there's more to come because there's so much more to say. But if it's not, well, wow, what a way to go because it's just outstandingly good. Cool. And it's interesting how he, the album title is a question. So he's asking you as a listener, is this the life you really want? And that already gets you, you know, okay, what the heck has he got to say in this record? I mean, that's an invitation to, you want to debate or you want to hear what yeah. I got to say? It's amazing. I think what he's always done, yes. he's given you his opinion. Yeah. It's always a challenge. It's a challenge. Are you paying attention? Do you see what's happening round about you? Yeah. Do you well, understand? And what I think he's saying is, that. sorry, Lewis. What I think he's saying is, throughout these albums, I'm pissed off. Why aren't you? Why aren't you trying to make a change? Why aren't you trying to do something to better what is going on or to correct what is going on? You know, um, and that has its place. That's fantastic if that's what you want to do. But there are times when there are people just want to be entertained at some point in time. Oh well, yeah, don't get me wrong. Do you know what I mean? I'll go and put on unskinny bop by poison. Yeah, but oh my god! From this <laughs> album, I know what I'm going to get when I put this on. Do you know exactly? You know, and, and, and you know, he asks you this question using the graphic of the fucking Mueller report. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, so yeah. so he he because he is now you know whether or not he's a U.S. citizen, I don't know, but he's a permanent resident. He lives here. Yeah, well, it's interesting. He, like, he, this is an interesting point, Lewis, because yeah. a lot of the sound samples on here are things like the speaking clock. It's things like the BBC closing down for the evening. Now, that's very pertinent if you're paying attention to what's happening in UK politics. Right now, last couple of days, BBC under threat. Whether you think that's a good thing or not, I don't know. But he's almost foretelling your BBC will shut down. But all of these things I remember from my youth, and it's a remarkably British album in that sense, but very it's much a so. what he's talking about. Yeah. I think it's very clever, very clever in these, really do. Very clever. Cool. Is that a hype sticker you have on that CD, Stephen? Uh, whatever give you that impression, Peter. I have no I idea what, what impression you could possibly get from that. Mm. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Martin subscribes to that as well. All right, there you go. I've started to subscribe to that too with my uh i made no for some <laughs> reason i started to do that too i drive bob crazy i'm like can you take this off for me and just help me put it on character <laughs> don't rip it don't rip it he's like Fuck off. i'll do it i don't have too many hype stickers to start now it's it's a lost cause <laughs> all right armando what's your number two okay well this is where steven and i divert my number two is amused to death from 1992 um well, in turn, there you go. That's the the remastered version of it, Billy. Yeah. yeah, and that's the original. That's the original cover. Uh, came out in ninety two. Um, the album itself, I mean, it's it. Again, it's social commentary. the The music is fantastic. It's a longer album. It's like seventy two minutes. You got fourteen tracks. The players on on the album are like Steve um, Steve Lukather, Jeff Beck. Jeff Picaro, Don Henley, Rita Coolidge on the title track, you know. Um, and, you know, again, the themes of the album are like, you know, it's the, it critiques the first Gulf War. And what I got from it is the, this is what I wrote, the perceived intelligence and progression of society as seen through the eyes of a chimp because the, you know, the cover, you have a, you have a monkey or a chimp, why, like, skimming through like watching tv like turning the dials right 
For Jones, me, Jones. it's monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. That's what the guy did. <laughs> and I'm looking at this cover, and I'm thinking, this is a bloody fantastic cover, yeah. because it's saying, you know, the monkey is basically saying, you, you know, the human, the human species is supposed to be like the top of the of the of the chain in terms of intelligence and and progression, etc. But you guys are, are no, you're no better, you know, further along than 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 anyone really i mean you really haven't solved any issues you really haven't solved any problems and what are you going to do to fix it and you just keep spinning your wheels so i think it's a it's a fantastic album it's it's a more natural album there's an, um it was produced by patrick leonard who worked with pink floyd and madonna and uh, mostly madonna and I, you know, that i looked up um I just think the, and you know, you have out tracks like what God, what God wants, part one, part two, part three. Uh, you know, tracks like that are fantastic. I, I just think overall it's a, it's a um, again, he's not as angry on this album as he is on the last two. I mean, he's angry, but he's like, he's basically saying, you guys are, are basically fucking up your own lives and you have nothing, no one but yourself to blame for that so get your shit together and move on right so yeah that's my number two i'm sticking by that <laughs> so all right rick number two okay well um uh it's pros and cons of hitchhiking and uh one other thing i could add to that hasn't been said is like um it's the only uh reference Besides, it does sound like a Pink Floyd production. I mean, you would if you didn't know Final Cut was in between this. Uh, it sounds like something that what uh, the Floyd to did. But I, I want to mention about the font. It's very similar to the wall writing. You know, the wall just not black. If you look at it, it looks like you know the lyric sheet inside the Walls album. And so that was sort of uh, to you know he had his fingerprint all over that the Wall album as we know, and he carried on that concept of theater in this record and i love the air clapped and stuff and i remember getting this as a kid uh i got it as a cassette first right uh, i was at one of those pharmacies that had the cassettes on the uh wait beside the counter and i saw Roger waters i know he's from pink floyd and again i'm about i don't know 14 at the time and and i grabbed it and said what the i check that out put it in my walkman i'm that kid that had the walkman everywhere and so i listened on my walk home and i was like wow this is incredible i i was captivated by the the mood i didn't know about the real time stuff that I would learn later as i get the vinyl and the cd and i think that's cool i love people when they think outside of the box like that and uh and Eric Clapton isn't known to be a lot of slide work, you know, like he, you know, I mean, he does, but there was a lot of that in here. And I guess, you know, um, with David Gilmore, always have the heavy delay and a lot of those special tools for in his toolbox when it comes to guitar trick. Eric Clapton had to do something in his vein that was somewhere close to the Gilmore sound. So that's why I think I enjoyed it a lot. But it was also interesting to learn that he got some people like Jack Palance to be the actor for the Hells Angels and Madeline Bell to be the Hells Angels girlfriend. So it was like a, an all-star cast just being, uh, doing the script, you know, like here's my script. I want you guys to play these things out. I mean, uh, that's very common in Disney movies later on, getting famous people to come on the record, but that's pretty new at that time. I think that was kind of uh, incredible. And um, and I remember uh, liking it in the first listen, and uh, but it was over my head. I didn't really get it. But as I got older and older, uh, I learned uh, you know what was the concept and how he did it. So I do have some bootlegs where Eric Clapton have performed these songs live, and he does it with justice. But that tour was uh, um, didn't last long because of the concert sales were not doing that well, and he ended up having a whole different team. So, uh, but it was interesting hearing these songs live with that power behind it, with you know the live sound, with you know. Is that always a little more uh, larger than life? And so not everything so dynamically quiet 
like you hear in this record. But I really enjoy this. And I, I, I got to be number two because of the history I have it. I have very fond memories of saying, this is a Pink Floyd album in my mind. And I, I did felt like the, I, didn't, I thought he continued where he left off from the wall in terms of his imagination bringing theater in an audio form. So, yeah, that's my number two. Pretty crazy when you think that the tour didn't really do that well. I mean, it's we're not that far removed from the the you know the hugeness that was the wall, and you know, Pink Floyd is still a pretty big name around that time, and as as was Roger, so it's kind of perplexing. But, it, but it's it, you know, I remember going to see John Entwistle solo at clubs where my band would play, and we would have a, a, a similar draw. John Entwistle of the Who, you know, like come on, right? It's crazy. But yeah. it's the, the the that was the thing that of the power of the brand. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, had Roger Waters not done what he did, had he said, "I am Pink, and this is my brand, and I'm going to keep it," then then he wouldn't have had those problems ever, right? Because, I think because everybody just like, wanted to protect the cash cow. Yeah, yeah. He had this weird fight that he had to know we're no longer a band, and there's no longer Pink Floyd, right? I think that's what. Just and, not to, not to go off too far, but I think that that's what hurt him in the beginning. Yeah. Is that you know he tried to he tried to sue Pink the rest of the guys in Pink Floyd. Yeah, and you know number one he he, he wasn't getting along with 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 Richard Wright and he kicked him out of the band and and then he tried to stop them from performing and and they said no we want to perform we want to go on if you don't want to be a part of it that's fine but we have a right to go on. And he went around denouncing it, denouncing them. And, and yeah, yeah. I think in the end, I think it hurt him in the beginning. Yeah, it got ugly. It got ugly. It got really ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uglier than this face. But yeah, I got ugly. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, but yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to No, there's, there's a couple of other things I can mention is that the fact that there are some musical passages that are similar to the wall. You can tell when he presents yeah. it. Uh, there's a little bit of a string movement to um, is there anybody out there and all that little music. There's a little similar passage of music that's not far removed from there. And then even the acoustic, it sounds almost like uh, animals or, or pigs on the wings, uh, the, an acoustic solo part and vocal only. So there was some um, Pink Floyd trick that he'd done in the past record that he kind of sandwiched in the in between the song just to give it that Pink Floyd feel in my mind, including the font on the record. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all four albums have what these days we would call Easter eggs, but are little lyrical moments where he revisits revisits Pink Floyd songs and those musical motifs. Most guys, when they leave a band, especially under kind of bad circumstances, want to just shove it all in the past. But I really like the way that Roger kind of went, you know, this bit was mine, and now you, were you paying attention here? And this bit links to this, both in terms of music and theme. And it's really quite clever. Um, in terms of the, the font and everything in, in the album, I mean, Gerald Scarf, who obviously had those connections, that was very much his theme. I mean, even things where he did, I think, the titles to a sitcom over here in the UK called Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, that was all done in exactly the same way. The font and, and the artwork and all these various things, but it just was perfect for Waters. It really just said everything about what he wanted to do, it really, really tied it together nicely. Yeah, yeah. At that uh, high-pitched scream that he did periodically on, you know, like Set the Controls for Heart of the Sun and on the wall is on every one of these solo albums. Like briefly, you hear that kind ah, of type of thing. Pops up everywhere. Yeah, that angst, the, the angst in his voice, right? Amazing it's scream. Like one it's, minute. Everywhere. it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's reckon it's yeah. unre you know, recognizable. Hi, You're number two. All right. My number two is uh Amused to Death. Um, I agree, Armando. It's a it's a good concept for a cover, but I, I don't I don't think the photograph's very good, and I don't like the way the 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 font is the same. You know, the types the point size is the same for the title. And I think the, this uh, one's a little you know, better, but this one isn't great either. Name. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That's that's pretty porcupine tree looking, right? But yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. so so if uh, you know this one now makes the pros and cons of hitchhiking look sound like a demo, which makes all every Pink Floyd album sound like a demo. It's one of the most elaborately put together, gorgeous sounding albums of all time. Um, you know, you mentioned the various female singers, also PP Arnold on here, right? Um, 
Ike Hat, uh, and that's the the whole Perfect Sense Part One and Two, where where this is like the second coming of the Claire Tory situation, right? Um, I, <laughs> I one thing one thing I um I always joke about this album is that it it actually I I actually found myself very often not reaching for it in a lot of cases because there is so much of Rick, like you say, there's so much stuff that's mixed so quietly. And then there's the bombast, right? So this this is one of those really extreme quiet to loud albums. The same way I kind of joke about Steve Hackett having those two sides of his duality, right? The, the heavy rock and Steve Hackett and the Spanish guitar Steve Hackett, right? Um, but here, but here it's here it's the quiet contemplative sound effects in the background, you know, setting the mood and then boom, you know, everything everything blows up right um exactly. but uh you know and and to put it in context again i mean this is this is him not certifying with this album at all and yet 94 you you finally get another pink floyd album the division bell and it goes three times platinum so he's same things happening to him right pink floyd the brand is doing great right as you say lewis right the the yeah. brand is so important and uh and yet he figures out a way later in life to to turn that around um when when he become he he kind of takes over the band just by the will of his personality in a way right he 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 takes over the band uh, the brand the wall more more than the brand pig floyd i suppose right um but but he, uh he didn't he didn't tour this album um and uh, and basically, it wasn't that much of a success. Critically, it was it was reviewed quite well. The first two albums are like forty one minutes, forty two minutes. This is now seventy three minutes. So this is the longest of all the four we're going to talk about here. And uh, and yeah, I I just love it. Um, I, I definitely I, I find it to be a pretty political album uh, on the anger level. I'd say it's kind of the same as all of them, maybe even more so than Radio Chaos. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I just uh, I, I think this is like and, and Roger says it himself. He, he says there's two records I, I have in my catalog that are masterpieces. One of them is Dark Side of the Moon. The other one is, is Amused to Death. So, uh, yeah, love, love mm. it a lot. And uh, so Pink Floyd. And that's my number two. Cool. Lewis. All right. Uh, my number two is a record that I think is almost perfect which is is this the life we really want this record to me it, it it um first of all it came at a time when i wasn't expecting anything right and i think you have to be a real idiot to walk away from your best work and the guy doesn't he actually he quotes quite liberally from animals from everything he's ever done in this. And, 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 and the, when you can really appreciate it is when you see it live. When you see this tour, the one I took my daughter to, it just opens with this shot of this girl with a blanket over her back and the sea. And this just stays there for quite a while. There's nothing happening. Yeah. It's, it's, it's again, this game that he likes to play with, like in music, you have suspensions. He doesn't give you the third. Well, in this thing, there's this thing, but it's not changing or it changes in a very subtle way and it starts to make you anxious, right? And as you start to hear some of these songs alongside Welcome to the Machine and alongside some of his other stuff, you realize that it, it fits perfectly. He's able to craft a new story in that concert. So this is the thing I have always said, and I know this is controversial, but to me, I think that David Gilmour was the heart of Pink Floyd and Roger Waters was the brain. It's, it's, it's as simple as that, okay? David Gilmour has a whole lot of nothing to say that I want to hear. But Roger Waters doesn't have this musicianship, doesn't have that sense of melody. And when you put them together, it's more than the sum of the books. In this record, he is now, he's already done the wall. He's already claimed the success that he felt was his, right? In all these tours, and he's become big. And even when you see the wall, he, there is a, a measure of peace at a personal level. His despair is entirely about society. It's not about himself, right? And I, and, and I think that um, when, you, when you watch him, craft the story that he's always telling you a story 
the story of that tour interlaced with the story of this little girl, this refugee girl, right? And he mixes it with the whole thing, Floyd. It's, it's just such a masterpiece that I, I can't but be in awe of, to me, this is really like Frank Zappa's project object concept. It shows you that he's actually thinking how it all fits into a larger body of work. It's not just, this is the album and I'm done. It's like, no, I, 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 I'm, we, we're still having this conversation, right? And he can just be, he can, he uses these, these, these crazy musical Legos and, and it just works. And again, this is, this is truly a headphone album, like all Roger Waters albums. I think that, that Rick is right on. This is not a party record. This is not, if you need to, to cheer up, you don't reach for this. You have to Ooh. forget it, right? But that's not what it's for. And, and I think it's important that you get your universe zeros and your Roger Waters, and there is a space for music that's going to challenge a different part of your head and a different part of your being, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think um, it, it is incredibly political in all the best ways possible, starting from the cover artwork, right? And everything about it, I love it. So yeah, it's my number two. But it's only because the number one is just so undeniably an absolute masterpiece to my ears, right? But this record absolutely kicked my ass when it came out. I, I, I didn't stop listening to this for months when it came out because this was not something I expected. I, and I was very happy to discover he had it in him. And I, I just hope, right, that he can do more. I, I, don't ha I haven't had enough, but give me more. This, this is the right balance of all the elements, right? This, there's an evolution that has happened. And, and he's working with I Love Lucius, the two singers, these two, I think they're sisters or they look like, I don't know if they really are, but um, yeah, they I'm take the place of the, of the original backup singers. And everybody in the band are these young guys. He doesn't have the, the old musicians he had before. They're all young guys now, right? I think the oldest guy he had with him was his own son. Harry Waters, and I don't even think he's with a band anymore. So he, you know, this, this is a, this is a cool thing. Um, I, I I love this. I love this record. I if anybody hasn't heard it, I would highly recommend that you you do. Again, you know, don't expect wish you were here. Don't expect. Just let it do its thing, right? Give it a fair shot, because I, I love it. I think it's a it's a remarkable accomplishment for somebody his age who has absolutely nothing to prove, but he still puts a lot of himself into it. This is, this is almost painfully sincere. And I love it. This is my number two. Well, it's been five years since then. So hopefully uh, he doesn't take 15 like he did the last time to come out with something because yeah, I mean, he's getting up there, right? Just like we yeah. are. We'll see. My number two is uh, pros and cons of hitchhiking. Uh, I agree with pretty much everything everybody said. I really, I, I like this one quite a bit. And uh, I will echo everybody's sentiments. Uh, it's got a familiar sound. It's, it's produced very, very well. I like Clapton's guitar work on the album. I will say nobody mentioned them and I'm a fan. And I think he sounds spectacular on this album. David Sanborn, who is a terrific, yes. terrific That's right. player. That's and, right. Yeah, he's screaming all throughout this album his sax is just like man in your face and very different from a lot of the stuff you know he kind of morphed into that kind of smooth jazz thing in the latter part of the 80s into the 90s but if you listen to sam Bourne's work in the 70s uh, in the early 80s i mean really really good player that i don't think gets mentioned enough when we kind of look back on those great sax players of like the the fusion era but uh yeah pros and cons of hitchhiking number two i dig it quite good quite good and you bring the saxophone player that's like what you did with duck died and moon right they bought saxophone player and uh us and them it's yeah, that the yeah. kind of Pink Floyd thing too to do that so yeah, absolutely yeah. and I, I like roger's vocals quite a bit on this album as well we haven't really talked about him from a vocal perspective much but uh you know you know what you're going to get with him most of the time and i think he sounds quite good on this album so i agree all right everybody's number one steven what do you got yeah. Well, I think he sounds absolutely fantastic on Amused to Death. Vocally, I think everything about this is fantastic, to be quite honest. Um, it's interesting because I agree with some of the things that have been said throughout that Roger is an angry guy. You can't argue with that. Um, angry in his music, 
angry as an individual? I don't know, but some people find them difficult to get along with, for want of a better turn of phrase. But I actually think there's a journey through the albums going right back to Floyd. He's not just angry all the time. He tends to be angry at certain things. But then, well, as we probably all do, is as you grow older, those emotions change. And I actually think, as I say, on the most recent album, I think he's resigned. Not in a kind of giving up kind of way, but just exasperated. That's maybe a better turn of phrase. I think on this album, he's disappointed. He's disappointed by what we've kind of let ourselves become. Yes, we are amused to death. I mean, we open with the ballad of Bill Hubbard, which is a remarkably moving piece about, you know, a First World War soldier being left in no man's land because the only person that found him didn't have the strength to carry him. And then the weight that the person that left him behind then carries through the rest of their life. And we immediately segue from there into somebody talking about watching war on the television as a form of entertainment. Are we winning or are we losing? Yep. Do you know, we have been amused to death. It's, it shows the ridiculousness of, I mean, back then we were talking about sitting in front of the massive screen. As we say, it's a very porcupine tree kind of cover because that's really what we were talking about at that stage too, with fear of a, of a blank planet. But now, I mean, we have all of these things that well, we're doing right now as well, to be fair, but we've got phones and distractions and all of this stuff and we allow ourselves to be completely blindsided by what's really going on in life by the trivialities that we all love, let's be honest. And this album focuses on that massively, I think, and just the way that we're duped by so many different, different organisations or religion, amused, you know, amused to death. It's just, I think, a phenomenal piece of work. And then you do have things like, you know, what God wants, God gets. You've got those massive memorable moments. There's hooks in there and there's choruses in there. Lyrically, were you ever going to get hit off this album? Well, no, but then again, you should never got hit off the wall. And that, to me, this is a companion piece to the wall. It moves things along, but musically, it is not shy in saying, this is the same guy that did that, that did this. And I think that was quite a brave statement because a lot of artists go back and have a, a, a kind of second stab at something that they did really well. And everyone goes, nobody did that about this, but it wasn't received the way that it should have been. But I think it's a remarkable achievement. Um, would I say it's perfect? I don't know if very much anything is perfect. Wow, it's close. It's really close. And all these years down, down the line, we're, where are we now? Nearly, what, what are we, 30 years down the line now? Yeah. And it's fresh and it's vibrant and it's relevant. And how many artists can say that about what they recorded 30 years ago, it's relevant. It's a shame that it's relevant, but man oh man is it relevant. So my number one is Amused to Death. It's a remarkably strong catalogue. There's only one album out of the four that I think, yeah, it's okay. The other three, I think, are outstandingly good. And by a whisker, I'll put Amused to Death at my number one. There you go. Amanda, you're number one. Well, my number one is this is this what we really want? Um, yeah. the the album itself, I mean, it, like Lewis said, it came out as a big surprise. I never knew that he was going to be releasing it. Like when I heard about it, I'm like, oh, I gotta get this. Um, and then when I heard he's gonna to tour, and I, yeah, we have to go see this because it's whenever he does a tour, it's it's an event. It's not just a concert, it's an event. Um, and just really quick, Lewis, we, when the when the show starts, you have that like that scene on the on the screen, and there was somebody beside me in the section saying, "Is this show going to fucking start or what? Like, what's going on here?" Because it just kept, it was just a long gap, just like you know, of the screen, and tension. just and like yeah, it's the tension. I just kept thinking, "Let it bloody happen. Just relax. You'll be here for two hours, you know, and more." But um, the um what what Pete said what he didn't like about the album in terms of the laid back uh, the music in terms of the the playing I liked about it um I just I liked the production overall he worked with uh Landro Godrich who worked with Radiohead and when they went in to do this album he basically said to him you need to pair, pace it back a little bit 
you know, because he had to remind him that Dark Side of the Moon was only like 43 minutes or something like that. He says, don't, you know, just, he wanted to hear the poet come out in Roger Waters, right? In terms of the lyrical content and, and the music. So um, I just, I overall, the production thing is gorgeous. Um, very minimalistic playing, like a lot of spaces in the playing, right? So it's, and, and the singles that they pick, like Deja Vu, The Last Refugee, you know, Smell the Roses and Wait for Her, which I think was an unofficial single, like a radio single. I think they're all fantastic. I think it's just a fantastic album. And apparently I read that the, the album was banned in Italy. It was banned in Italy. Uh, due to some claimed plagiarism thing that was going on, that he stole the idea from another from another artist in Italy. So they banned the album. Um, but even the cover art, I mean, he puts the question, is this the world we, you know, we really want? And he's asking, okay, I know what I want. What the hell do you want? I want to hear your answer. I want to hear what you think we can do with this, with the, what we call earth and where can we go from here right and even the sound bites with donald trump you know saying that you know um you know i won i won you know this organization is a smoothly run organization i don't know what you guys are doing on cnn and he just turns off because oh, shit i can't take that like i don't want to hear that shit because it isn't it isn't running smoothly there is something wrong going on right so i mean he's always going to ask those questions but when I saw him on this tour, I, he had more fun this time. Yeah. You could tell he enjoyed playing. I mean, there were, there were, there were pictures of him in Edmonton um, when he was doing the tour and he was taking pictures of people in, in restaurants and coffee shops and smiling. And he's like, and he even said, he goes, I'm enjoying my life right now. I'm enjoying this band. I'm enjoying this album. It's the best work I've ever done thus far. And I'm going to have fun with it. And come to the show, you're going to have fun too. You're go I'm going to make you think, but you're going to have a good time. And I'm like, you know what? A magic album. Top to bottom. Yeah. Any more? <laughs> you can't say more than that, right? <laughs> I enjoy it. I just I think it's nice. great. All right, Rick, how about your number one? Well, uh, what's left for me is the music to death, and I amuse it, and I'll be loving it to my death. It is a masterpiece. I mean, uh, and you know what? You think you, how can you do Dark Side of the Moon, which you hear in the, um, the Animals, which is one of my favorite albums, and yet he still never ceased to amaze me. And I'll piggyback what uh, my brother, uh, proud brother Steven said. I mean, it is uh, a, a gorgeous album and very thought-provoking album. And I was reading stuff around that time about manufactured consent, how media can almost influence the way you think. And and so it was way time fitting for me to to, to get this album. And also we all experienced the Gulf War and how it was, uh, or, and that was in the past. And then in every series of events, right up to 9-11 and all these uh, historic events that happened. And, um, how the television uh, can stir emotions and people were actually entertained by it, like you said. Uh, it being, you know, it glued to the television and yet uh, also they were, uh, um, you know, what they show up on them is how they affect. And I think another thing about this record is to me, he's like a work, work, working class hero. And he's always talking about anti-capitalism, how unjust it can be. Whether you sell your with with religion or through money, uh, you know it it it, um, it talked about it pros and cons if you want to use that term again uh, to the you know the capitalism and how the media will help shape the way you think and so I thought um, one thing you got to mention Jeff Beck is on it I mean Jeff Beck is doing an awesome stuff and and it's so. Uh, because Jeff Beck is an unpredictable, uncanny player, and yet it suits this album all the way through. I think he got all these, uh, it, it was like adding exclamation marks on the statement that you want to say. If it wasn't lyrically and if it wasn't already proven his point by his emotion as a singer, he had the music to help emphasize that. And I thought Jeff Beck was a great uh, idea. And I saw this tour. 
uh, well, the In the Flesh tour, where they, like Lewis said, um, he would showcase this, you know, from Pink Floyd's song, and it fit like it, you, it, it belonged in that whole, uh, that evening of all these songs. Uh, and he had the crowd on their feet singing some of the heavy choruses on here. Uh, and so I thought that was great, you know. It wasn't one of those things where people go to the washroom as soon as he plays a, a new song, like some people do. They just want to hear the hit of the Pink Floyd. He actually kept them there the entire time because it was that that moving, and it was so well put in in a way that it piggybacked off a great Pink Floyd song, and then he go here, here's some uh, stuff modern, and it makes sense to, like, like Stephen said, it was relevant. It was a relevant message, and he always had the video to support that. So if you didn't get it lyrically, you get it visually. And so that is a great, if you haven't got this, you got to get it. It's a must. And another thing I just add uh, that uh, that wasn't said about this uh, already. Yeah, sure, there's part one, part two, and that's something he did with a lot of albums that he had a conclusion, whether it's The Wall and other songs that he always kind of like uh, uh, hold that thought. We're coming back to that. And I do something else, and we're coming back to that because it's all part of a package deal. So a great concept album, a masterpiece, and I really love it. Uh, not only sonically, uh, but witnessing this live was just as equally important for me to finally really understood the whole message. Because uh, yeah, the you know the lyrics are really good, but when you actually see the video behind all this, what he did, that's amazing production. So anyway, uh, without further ado, this is number one uh, for me, Roger Waters at his finest hour, A Me to Death. Martin? All right, my number one is, uh, is this the life? Yeah. We really want, I, I it's, it's this, this title is so hard to remember, right? You want to move the really around. You, you do, oh, you, is it I really want? It, it drives me nuts, right? But I love this album to death. <laughs> Anyways, um, it is probably my most played album of the last bunch of years. I've, I've played this easily 500 times. Um, I, I love the whole idea that it is paired back, uh, but yet there's still a lot of ear candy in it as well. And Stephen, you, you nailed it perfectly with this idea of resignation. Um, but also, you know, he talks about how it's also an album about... Uh, surprise you can have romantic love late in life sort of thing so it's it's uh it's uh you know rediscovering that that side of himself but also what i've what i feel is the big package around it is it, it is essentially an album about old age um and and it's almost like in amused to death he's he's there watching and and hoping he can change things and he's railing a little bit and here he's not really railing anymore he's just quietly telling you what's going on and it's like i'm starting to lose the energy to deal with this i'm gonna have to pass this on to someone else to, to start dealing with this um and there's some beautiful little things in it um you know uh, it's not beautiful but but that first explosion that goes on in deja vu um that is that is absolutely stunning the way that is is laced into this super you know gauzy cozy ballad type song which is still a very angry political song there's a lot of angry angry political stuff on here but again the the anger is it's and and, and um i'm not sure who who said it but the sincerity uh and and just the directness of, of what you're uh, hearing on here as well. There's this beautiful part where just before the uh, broken bones, the little kind of campfirey song, he clears his voice. You hear him clearing his voice there. Oh, that's just a magical yeah. moment. And then, and then at the end, you get essentially a suite of songs, which again, deceptively titled because they sound so different, but wait for her oceans apart, the short one and part of me died all kind of go together. And yeah, they're all segued. Yeah. yeah, and and there you really get the idea that this is an album about old age, mm -hmm. like like it might be one one of the last things he's going to do. Maybe it isn't. Maybe maybe it is. Um, and I'll I'll second the opinion as well that it just sort of got dropped on the world. Like people didn't really know this was 
happening in a big way. There was not a lot of hype and hoopla around it. I mean, I'm not crazy about the album cover again or the packaging where you have to dig everything out of the, you know, the, the little corner thing and all that. Um, and I, I really don't like that title. I mean, I, I never get through that title without having to think about it. I think the whole cover should be redacted. <laughs> but uh, but no, I, 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 I really agree. love it. Um, and yeah, the, the idea that, that uh, you know, Nigel Godrich, his idea was that, was that uh, as Armando, you said, I mean, the idea of I want to hear Roger the poet, but also I just want all the clutter removed. And also, it's, um, it's, it's exactly at, at that 53 minute mark as well. He wanted a shorter album out of him as well. Uh, but I think could go all, all to the that's end. That's exactly right. But, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Play it all the time. Love it to death. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing I love about it more than anything uh, is, I mean, this might be like a really almost like crass and crude and simple way of putting it, but this is the one that is full of the most songs. It's the hookiest one, even, even though they're dark hooks. And Lewis, I totally agree yeah. with you. I love miserable music, yeah. but this is, this is just miserable hook after miserable yes. hook after miserable yes, it's, hook. It's, it's really memorable yeah. And, yeah. and it sits so well with the old Floyd stuff. That's when yeah. you fully, that, that's when it fully, I got it. When mm -hmm. I saw him do it live and he inserted it into the old Floyd catalog, I, I suddenly realized, my God, this guy is even smarter than I thought. Yeah. It's Mike, you, didn't, you didn't think that the idea looked like, like, you know, Watergate when Nixon would cross out stuff. And yeah, 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 yeah. That's is, what, yeah. yeah. It's a and redacted you know, it's document. Like FBI yeah. classified. I thought that was cool. But when I saw yeah. it as a, on Amazon and you buy it, I'm like, that's kind of a crappy cover, but when I hold it in my hand, I'm like, oh, it's like I got a secret document, oh, yeah, like yeah. classified info that, you know, only for your eyes only kind of thing. But, you know, I'm still, I'm getting mad when I go through the booklet. I can't read the lyrics. They're too small and they're in no. that red background yeah, yeah, on them, the strips. Oh, yeah. I got to sit there annoying. and just listen to it. Well, it upsets me about okay, the that's the way. I'm, okay. I'm reading the hype sticker. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. the hype sticker does not say miserable yeah, hoop after point. miserable hoop yeah. okay good i mean that, that, exactly. that's that's why nobody really bought this exactly. album yeah yeah didn't yeah, say yeah. that on it yeah. okay yeah. but armando you make a really good point about about you got to listen to it because this record i mean he is so clear and he's just like you guys say he's He's speaking the lyrics. They're recorded so well. The music yeah. is fair around him. It, it's you don't miss a single word. It's just yeah, all but, right there, but right? Just quickly, this is not a soundbite album. Like we, like Peter, you, you and I have talked to, like not talked, but like in terms of on the chat about people saying, you know, um, I don't have time to listen to albums. I just want like one song here and there. You can't do that with this album. You need no. to sit and listen and just even if you can't read exactly you know mm -hmm. headphones or you know just if you're alone just turn it on in the house and just let it go i and find most of these albums are like that it's yeah they're they're exactly. the singles released here and there but most of these albums you have to listen to from start to finish they're as out as a whole because they're all, they're, they, they make a statement and yeah. they're all segue together all the tracks are segue together yeah. um i i just think you know i just think that this is one of his best albums, if not the best so far. But uh, but unlike pros and cons and amused to death, you don't have to run across the room to your stereo and turn the volume down when when you know the bombast comes, right? And at least, yeah, at least yeah, it's all exactly with it. Because oh, there'll be like God. quiet moments. Be crazy. Be... Amused to death drives me crazy for that. I just there'll, there'll be like really surreal, serene moments, very quiet. All of a sudden you hear like, oh, like it's just when you hear bombast and like explosions, yeah. and you're like, what? I mean, the... Martin, are you what familiar are you with a, with a, a Norwegian prog band called White Willow? Vaguely, yes. <laughs> Those guys yeah. are the kings of the dynamic. Are range. they? Okay. <laughs> they, they, especially their early, the first three albums, they actually yeah. boast it. They say, watch out, protect, you know, this is going to be a lot yeah. of. Okay. Yeah. 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 Super but they do like give that. you a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, white roll will lull you to sleep with this little acoustic piece and then all of a sudden like at the drop of the hat this huge hammond organ and mellotron just crashes in and this burst of guitar and then you blink and it's like back to the and you're like yes. what just happened yeah, there, right? no, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, i'll tell you quickly yeah. when we went to see the wall because i know the wall front to back and i knew when the explosions were going to happen and i knew what was going to happen with the music i knew when the swells were going to come up and the whole and i'm like that and i usually jump really easily for like loud noises i did not move bob out of his seat 
boom, like he almost went over the railing, right? And I'm just like, having fun? Yeah, cool, okay, good. You know, like, <laughs> like but I mean, that's what you get with the Roger Waters concert. It's, it's, it's an experience, it's an event, right? And you get all that bombast and, and everything that goes with it, which is wonderful. But there are times when you don't, you don't want that. You just want a good album to listen to. And this is it. Yeah. I think it's also worth mentioning, though, the way that the albums are constructed, because, I mean, it's, it's a common used trope that artists, you know, weave in spoken word sections or samples from the radio or, you know, ambient noise. It's often a gimmick. And it's a real Waters kind of trope. He, he relies on it on a regular basis. And it's not a gimmick. It mm -hmm. genuinely advances what the song's about. It genuinely pulls you in. It's always really important to what's going on. And that's really quite a skill because th there are so many albums that you listen to, you think, well, I like that bit. But... Or it's a gimmick, but he's allowed to do it because he invented it. I mean, it, right. in, a sense, yes. yeah. in a sense, it's like it's Pink Floyd is a super huge band because of this gimmick. I mean, on, you know, in, in base terms, a lot of what a lot of people love about Floyd is all of those soundtracky bits. That's right. 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 No sound effect from heartbeat okay. to airplane to whatever. I'll tell you really, I'll tell you quickly. I remember buying the wall. It was 1988, downtown Toronto, A Records on Young Street, man. And I bought it for like $8.99, you know, and I thought it was such a, you know, it was such a great find. And I would sit there with my headphones on and like two hours worth and just enjoy it. But the, I mean, it took you from point A to point Z and you didn't, for me, I didn't mind the little vignettes and the little like spoken passages and stuff because it took you, it carried you along in a story. And for me, that's, that's worth its weight in gold in terms of an album. It keep you tuned in completely. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it pulled you in and it wouldn't let you go until it was done. As the wall begins how it ends. That's it. That, that's right. <laughs> so it's supposed that's to right. be an endless loop, right? That's right. Sorry, um, P. I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. Sorry. All right. My number one has to be, can only be this one. Um, I mean, if you, if you actually look at this cover, yeah, it's a monkey watching TV, but it's a, a, a deeper thing. It's mm -hmm. telling you that TV is watching you, <laughs> right? The marketers are learning about you. This is before there was all this shit with Facebook, but long before that, right? This is the TV is watching you. These assholes want to know everything about <laughs> monkey so monkey can jump by and behave. Monkey see this is, To me, this is a, an iconic, super powerful image. And, and, and the whole record, right? The, the, what it does to me is it, uh, uh, as Steven said, it begins with the story of Bill Hubbard, right? And it just puts you into this place of remember in the past how war used to be. Before you had words like PTSD, you had shell shock, right? And, and, and everything gets sanitized and streamlined and placed into little cubby holes and you slowly strip away the humanity out of every fucking thing right and 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 this guy is saying no don't let them do this like we are killing each other in the in the dumbest way possible it's, he's basically saying george orwell was wrong big brother isn't watching he's dancing he's distracting you and he's turning you into a fucking idiot <laughs> And and I think okay. that it, it is a, it is such a brilliant, brilliant statement, right? And he then interweaves his own personal situation, his, his the loss of his father, which of course is a seminal thing in his work. Um, he he manages to mention it in three wishes, right? I wish when I was young, my old man had not been gone, right? It's all there, right? But but then he also mentions all the other the, the crass commercial commercialism of all this, you know, it all makes perfect sense expressed in dollars and cents, mm -hmm. pounds, shillings and pence. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, you know, the bravery of being out of range, you know, 
it's it's just to me it is it is just and of course having Jeff Beckham guitar, it takes the Gilmore formula, and just kicks it in. It it suddenly it's this super powerful sound that you never expected in that context, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I love David Gilmore to death, but this to me is just so good. It even has Fleum bass, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many great musicians making this happen. It was also the first album that I bought as an adult of Roger Waters as a musician who was starting a career and I was doing things. And and I, I just, I just, I dissected this thing at a level that is probably, you know, you know, mental, right? (laughs) But for me, this record, it was just something that I had to listen to because it just drew me in. And everything he was talking about, which was what happened to me with the wall. When I was a kid, I heard the wall. And the wall is like, wait a minute, you know, my dad died. There's all these, I didn't understand the whole bit about being a rock star and being pissed off and looking for a groupie. I didn't get any of that. But I did understand the isolation. And I understood what it was like to be in a school. I happened to go to the British system of education in Mexico. So I understood. I had those fucking teachers. I knew what he was talking about. You know, so for mm-hmm. me, it, it was very relevant. And this was a very relevant experience as, a, as, a, as an adult. He was talking about the things that were happening that, that made, you know, it, it just made it of its time. But yet he's a much older guy. He's seeing it with a with with a level of anxiety that I didn't have, because when you're young, you're dumb and and and, and bad shit only happens to the other guy. Right. But 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 as you get older, you start to appreciate it in, in other ways. So the music remained great, but now the message to me is even greater. So I I, I just love this record. And and um, when you again when you hear these songs live alongside, for example, Every Stranger's Eyes from Pros and Cons and other, it's just such a wonderful experience, right? You don't have Jeff Beck, right? You have the other two guys, the, the Texas lefty and the other guy who's always been with them. And they do a terrific job, right? They're, they're very competent players. They play great. But, but I'm just saying it's, it's just such a, such a perfectly balanced and timed record, right? It's almost like you can hear the guy take a breath as he goes on to his next point, right? That I, I, I absolutely love this. And, and the title track, you know, after It's a Miracle, you know, a doctor in Manhattan saved a dying man for free. It's a miracle, right? And yeah. then it wraps up with, oh, well, I guess in the end, the aliens came and they saw there used to be a civilization here, but everybody, you know, we just killed each other with this, with manufactured reality, with manufactured opinion, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what do we see today? I mean, I know this is not a political thing, but, but I mean, at a basic level, what does social media do? Social media is, is totally antisocial, right? <laughs> you create little bubbles of, of like-minded people and otherwise 100%. you just fight, you know? So this is what happens. I think that um, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful statement about things that they have almost like a, uh, I don't know, there was a, predict, there was a predictive power to some of these things. A revelation, is that yeah, there was there was a yeah a, a prescience, right? I don't know the okay. English word, but it's like it, there it, was something telling you this is coming, man. Watch out! Foretold. Keep your head on a swivel. This is some bad shit. And at that time, I, I didn't have a cell phone. I, I didn't care about anything. Right? I was living in Mexico. Life was simple, right? It was different. And all of a sudden, it all changed, right? So it, it was it was it was a very powerful album. I love it. I am. I love it. Love it. Love it. It's my number one as well, obviously. Uh, I mean, everybody made a lot of really good points about it. I think to me, this is, uh, I get pretty jacked when I hear this album. It's, for me, it's not even close. This is number one by a fairly wide margin. And uh, I like at times it's big and boisterous and powerful. And other times it's a little, you know, kind of meditative and moody and whatnot. And I totally agree with Martin's sentiment that it kind of jumps all over the place with like sonically, it's like, you know, it just kind of wakes you up and then it lulls you to sleep for a couple minutes and then you go back again. Uh, Jeff Beck's guitar work is absolutely incredible on here. It's almost like, I think Roger said to him, it's like, hey, the way you played on that guitar shop album you did, I want that on this album. Because it's like, this is like an extension of that album when Jeff is kind of like, 
quiet and melodic and those yearning lines and melody lines it's like wow that's like guitar shop stuff and then other times he's just doing all this crazy whammy bar stuff and he's loud and he's in your face and i'm like that's what i like the unpredictable jeff beck and he is doing that i wish he was on every single song on here but he's on enough of the album that it uh, really works and yeah this i mean what god wants the various parts the title track a lot of good stuff on here i enjoy this quite a bit and it's a great sounding album too great sounding album I mean, I don't even know how Jeff Beck does it, but there was a point in the album where he, his guitar sounds like they're slaughtering a sheep. Yeah, yeah. It's like this, it's like an animal oh, is God. dying and okay. somebody is just recording it and they just placed it a microphone so you could hear it like real close. Yeah. It's an amazing thing that he did, right? And he was just unleashed into this, 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 this whole mindscape of, of craziness, right? To some people, it's noisy, but to those who oh, appreciate beautiful. Jeff Beck, it's like, yeah. wow, that's just Jeff being Jeff, right? And that's right. It was almost right. like he said, play all the notes you haven't played before. Just like, okay, I got, I got a million of them up my sleeve. Here you go. Here you know, we go. Like, you know, yeah. Whatever you've played before, forget that. Play what you haven't played. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, okay, exactly. I can do that. Yeah. So there you have it, everybody. Uh, ranking the four main... Mr. Waters solo albums. Uh, and uh, Lewis, I don't know if you want to real quick just hold up some of those other ones you got there because he's done all well, sorts of other things. But. Yeah, I mean, th this is a collaboration with Ron Geeson. This is music from the body. If, if you are a fan of the early Floyd, the spacey, weird Floyd from the early days, this might be of interest to you. There's a lot of, and, and it has some of that juvenile, you know, not juvenile, but that, that kind of Monty Python esque sense of humor. They, they do managed to laugh a little bit at themselves and just the, the the silliness of the noises the body makes um it's, it's pretty good um he also made an opera album right i particularly am not a fan of opera so i when i i, I the only reason i have this in my hand is because it says roger waters and i i have to have everything he does and i have to listen to it I have to admit that this is not something I listen to very frequently. It's opera. So, and it's not necessarily the best opera ever, obviously, but it's not terrible. So if you happen to love opera, you may dig this. Me, not so much, but, you know. The thing I found uh, many years ago in a, in, a, in, a, in a record store called Amoeba in, uh, in Berkeley in California. This is a, an Australian, um, album. Um, this is a, not, the, as far as I know, this was not released here. And the reason I bought it is because it has um, a lot of the studio's songs he was working on around the time of the In the Flesh tour that never made it into a record. So it's got, you know, each small candle. It has Flickering Flame. Um, it has Towers of Faith and Lost Boys Calling. So this is why I bought this particular record. So it's kind of like a half of a, an unreleased studio album and it has some of a mixture of of all of these as well right but um mm -hmm. and and then there's a where anyway that when when the wind blows he made this there was this cartoon or it was a cartoon yeah it was about it's heartbreaking it's about a couple mm -hmm. who so, somehow survive a nuclear attack they're somewhere in wales or somewhere and they're they're just slowly dying from radiation and it just shows this this horrible thing but but the music is is, is quite good right it's, it's around the time of the movie the day after mm -hmm. and it's almost like roger waters and some other guy said all right hold my beer we're gonna make something that's gonna show you really how awful that would be yeah. how silly and, it is for you to duck and cover right it's it's about yeah. the, the the couple don't understand obviously yeah the nuclear you know what right, all, and right? things is going to be yeah. and they follow all of this advice to the letter they have their door against the wall and they use that as a shelter and it just shows the futility of the nonsense that everyone was getting taught back yes. then it is a it's a tough watch for a cartoon it has to be said yes it's not for it's not for the kids doesn't that sound sure. like fun uh, you know, no. it's, it's it's dark. Dark. at the same time it has to be said it's well done yes it's dark but it's but it's it's it was an important message i thought yeah so there you have it everybody uh in the comments below please rank the roger waters solo albums as you see fit and uh I want to thank all the guys here on the panel for taking part in this and visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org 
we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and of course we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Please make sure you go check out uh, martinpopoff.com and pick up some books. We did a whole show the other day, Craig Kaminsky and myself uh, ranking our favorite 10 Martin Popoff books. So if you uh, want to go shop for any, I'm sure Martin's got plenty of stuff he can ship out to you. Uh, Lewis and I are going to talk about uh, over the next hopefully couple of days, uh, this very cool album oh, here. You called uh, all we need is norm so more to come on that so uh very cool little collection of prog songs and uh tune in for more stuff here on the channel in the uh days ahead we've got uh, new album reviews tomorrow we've got the monsters den on thursday and martin and i will be back at you friday morning saturday's the uk connection with mr reed and mr bray bringing some more musical insanity on saturday and sunday we've got album homework assignment before we start the week all over again with the hudson valley squares and back at you next tuesday on in the prog seat. So for Stephen Reed and Armando Venditti and Rick Labonte, Martin Popoff and Louis Nasser, I'm Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you real soon. Good night. Good night.